right. As you're coming in, thank you for getting in here. We'll give just another minute for any other latecomers. Uh, the, each, the book that's back there, One Nation Under God, uh, we're going to have reading assignments through those because we'll refer to them in future lessons. We'll actually look at a little bit in the introduction tonight, but it, it's a great resource. A friend of our ministry, Dr. David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, wrote this book. And uh, very well done, and I, I'm glad we're able to offer it as a resource for you. And then uh, on with the packet you got, I encourage you to take that uh, the blue uh, the the blue cover, and you can stick it in the front of the notebook like that the cover as a cover page. And then uh, then you can have the others inside your notebook. Okay, so that's what that was for. So you can have that as a cover page. Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to get started. Father, I love you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this country that you've given to us. Father, I pray that this study would be something that would help us, strengthen our faith, encourage us, uh, not only through your word, but through looking back at the history of the founding of our nation to see how your providential hand has worked on behalf of our land. Lord, we are a needy people, a country that needs to return back to you. And I pray that uh, you would once again bring a revival and that there would once again be a space and a time in our nation where you can bless us because we are a nation committed to righteousness. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I am an avid reader of history. Uh, the, uh, uh, that's probably the most books I read outside of what I need for message preparation. And, and for study in my Bibles, I read books of history. In my office, there's a, a couple of shelves uh, that are full from wall to end to end with books on history. And uh, so when Pastor Scott asked me if I would teach on this subject, um, my initial thought was, how can I condense all of that <laughs> into this? But So we're, we're essentially going to be doing an overview, but uh, my intention is actually for this to be a two-part series that so will do the first part this fall and the second part in the spring and uh, that hopefully will be a help to you um, as you look at the front page of our of our study um, the uh, you know one of the things we're going to recommend is that you get the copy of the book one nation under god by uh, david gibbs and you can uh, pay me after the class um, where you can do it online through our church website and just mark book fees on that and take care of it uh, but the, the, one of the things that we're wanting to do is uh, just give you an overview on the, the history of Christianity in America, in the founding of our country. On the front page of your, of your packet there, there's an outline of what my intention is that we're going to uh, go through in these next 10 weeks. Uh, we'll do an introduction lesson tonight on the purpose of the study. Next week, lesson one, the missionary endeavor, the heart of the Western discovery, dealing with Christopher Columbus and the Mayflower Compact. The next lesson on freedom to worship, the seeds of Western colonization. Um, the, the seeds of freedom were actually birthed in the Reformation long before they came to America. We're going to go through some of that. Uh, the next lesson is America as a place of hope, a home for the religiously persecuted. Uh, dealing with some of the Puritan covenants and a haven for religious dissidents. And we'll do a lesson on God and country, the relationship between religion and freedom in America, uh, Christianity and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We'll do a lesson on the separation of church and state, the founder's view of religion and politics, which is far different, by the way, yeah. than what you hear in the public square today. Mm -hmm. All right? And, <coughs> excuse me, we'll do a lesson on Philosophy of Education, the Biblical Influence in Teaching American Young People. What we have in our schools today is radically different than what was found in the early days of America. We're going to show you that. Uh, we'll do a lesson on the war and conscience, acknowledging the struggle of Christians in the war for independence. There are many good, godly Christians who struggle 
with the concept of taking up arms. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I never in the past had much patience for that mentality until I began meeting first generation Americans coming from countries where they were ordered to pledge allegiance to a dict dictatorial ruler. And, <clears throat> and if they refused to do so, they could go to prison. They could go to the gulag. They could go to a, a camp and never be seen again. And so it helped me change my perspective and, and understand. And then, you know, some of the reading I've done, uh, some of their, there are some very notable um, uh, war heroes who never picked up a gun in, in our history. And uh, so it, it is important for us to acknowledge, and even in America's battle for independence, there were godly Christians who said, I cannot take up arms, while there were others who said, I believe I can. And we need to understand that, that, that there is room within the faith for both opinions. You don't have to be one or the other and be a spiritual person. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that from our history, show you some of those big things in our history. Then we'll do a, uh, the last lesson I'm just calling it this and that, miscellaneous things to consider and questions answered. And then I put a little caveat in there. Uh, that's my intended schedule, but it could change, all right? As, we, as the lessons develop, they, we may take some little detours and so on. And uh, so just be prepared for that if you would. All right, so that's, that's our goal. That's our stated goal as we get going. Look with me on uh, uh, the first page of the actual lesson. The purpose of our study. Why are we doing this study? America is a nation that is unique in all of human history. There are only two nations in human history that were founded with God as a central part of the origin. Those two nations are Israel and America. However, they are totally different in their origin. They are not the same. Uh, but America is unique in that we are the only nation outside Israel that was founded with God as it, as it, at its core. And that's an important thing we're going to look at tonight. Let me say right at the beginning, we are not Christian nationalists. Right? There is a movement out there called Christian nationalism that tries to color everything in America and say it has to be done according to the Bible. We are not a theocracy. We have never been a theocracy, a government ruled by God. We have always been a, go a government of the people, by the people, for the people, but founded on the principles of religious liberty. And there is a big difference between the two. It is not the intent of this class nor the philosophy of our ministry that the church should be in a position to dictate to people how they live their lives. That makes us no different than what Roman Catholicism did during the Inquisition. That makes us no different than what Islam does in the Middle East. All right, so it is important that you understand we are not Christian nationalists. But we do see that America was founded under godly principles, and we're going to show you that from our history. So let's jump into it a little bit as we get started. Number one, Israel was a nation created by God. The nation of Israel was spoken into existence by God to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, we read it. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy land from thy country and from thy father's house unto a land that I will give thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed." So Israel was a nation that was founded by God himself. Isaiah 43, 1, God said this, But now, thus saith the Lord God that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. God said, listen, Israel, I'm the one who created you. It wasn't of your own might. It wasn't of your own will. It wasn't of your own doing. I created you. you. I gave you your name. You are mine. 
So don't fear. Fear not. The founding documents, if you will, the Constitution of Israel is the law of Moses, uh, known as the Torah today. It was given by God to Moses for the children of Israel. I really enjoyed, as Pastor Scott has been preaching through Genesis and Sunday nights, one of the things that he has mentioned a couple of times, that I don't know if you, have you caught it, that when we're reading about uh, in the Genesis account, and you may wonder, well, I wonder why they drew this part out, but other pieces are just mentioned but left alone, is uh, to remember the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness, and they had been 400 years in the paganism of Egypt, and God gave to Moses those words to teach them as they walked. So they were learning about the history of nations so that they would know why when they went into this land they needed to destroy these people. God was telling them why. He was saying, this is the line that rejected me. These are the people who are an abomination to me. And these, this is why these kings and these kings and these kings are to be destroyed from the face of the earth. And here's the history that tells why my patience has run out uh, on them. All right. And so the Torah, the law of God, uh, the law of Moses was the constitution, if you will, for the nation of Israel. Uh, they, they derived all of their laws from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They, they got all of their laws from there. Uh, in uh, Joshua 1, we read that after the death of Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel." Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, going toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. By the way, that, doesn't, that means Israel's land does not end where it is today. All right, the Israel, Israel of today only occupies a little over one third of the land God gave them. All right, just so you know, they haven't occupied it all yet, but they will again. All right, he said, there shall not be a man able to stand against thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. God told Joshua, follow the words of this book. Do it. If you will do that, I will give you the land. I will bless you. You will be strong and your enemies will fall before you if you'll do what I said. So God has given to Israel an eternal covenant of promise. The land of Israel is theirs in perpetuity by the promise of God. And God has called the Hebrews his chosen people. That's important for us to understand. God has not forsaken his people. He has not cast them off. He has not said, you are no longer mine. And uh, that is a, an important thing. So I asked the question here. I've used the word a couple times already. Uh, but just, uh, what is a covenant? Someone help me out. What, when, you, when we talk about God has given to Israel a covenant, what is a covenant? What's that even mean? An agreement. An agreement? Good. Yeah. What else? It's, it's even stronger than just an agreement. What other, what other things is that, would that bring to mind? A promise? Yeah. An oath? Right. Um, this uh, uh, Charles Hodge in his Systematic Theology says it this way. A covenant is a promise 
that is suspended on a condition. Now, it, the Hodge wrote in the late 1800s, so we don't always use verbiage that way. This is like the ceiling. This ceiling is a suspended ceiling, all right? That means the ceiling we're looking at is suspended from what's above it. And a covenant is suspended, held from above by a condition. This is a very strong term. A covenant is a promise that is held firm by a condition and attached to disobedience a certain penalty. So if the, if the conditions of the covenant are not kept, there is a penalty. And that's, that, that's what, a, what a covenant is. All right? And uh, so, for example... When, uh, when people enter into a covenant today, uh, there's, uh, there's one very common uh, legal document that you actually are told that you are signing covenants of, and that's called a mortgage. When you sign the papers for a mortgage, if you ever read that fine print, it's, it talks about it being covenants, that the covenants are being presented uh, for this exchange of property. Okay, a partnership, a marriage, all in all of these, a party will bind themselves together to fulfill the conditions of the covenant, and they agree to specific penalties if the conditions are not met. That's what a covenant is. Okay, when the term covenant is used in the Bible, is primarily in reference to God making a promise to a man or God making a promise to a nation. And it is sometimes used when men make a promise to serve and obey God. We have, with the nation of Israel, what is called an Abrahamic covenant. Or God saying to Abraham, I am making a promise to you and your seed. The difference is this. When, when the children of Israel... Ask God for his laws, God gave them a covenant that was based on obedience and disobedience. Here are the Ten Commandments. You obey them, you will live. You disobey them, you will die. But the covenant God made with Abraham was different. God told Abraham, essentially, it's a great story to read in Genesis. I think it's in chapter 14, if I remember correctly. Abraham goes into a deep sleep. And God takes the animals that he had had Abraham prepare. He had him cut the animals in half. And God passed between the animals and swear by himself that he would keep the oath. It was not dependent on Abraham doing anything. Different than the covenant he did with the children of Israel in the law. That covenant said blessing will only come if you obey. But the, the promise to Abraham of the eternal heritage of the land and of the people had nothing to do with Abraham's obedience. It was entirely on God. All right? So for those who say Israel is no longer God's chosen people because they rejected Jesus Christ, go back and look at the covenant. The covenant with Abraham had nothing to do with whether or not they accepted or rejected a future Messiah. Had it everything to do with God's integrity, a God who cannot lie. And scripture tells us there will come a day. We, in our lesson we did a year ago on the plan of God, there is coming a day when God will redeem Israel back to himself. They will see him who they pierced and they will weep and they will mourn and they will turn back to their Messiah. That day is coming, all right? So, um, remember, God did not choose Abraham and his descendants because they were a great people. He chose them because he loved them. Deuteronomy chapter 7. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath that he had swore to your fathers. Remember, that covenant was on God's side. 
he swore the oath. Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Israel, of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So it, uh, uh, and let me say this, if, if you want to learn more about God's covenant with Israel, uh, you could go to our YouTube channel and uh, go back to last year and uh, when um, on lesson number three on the plan of God revealed, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, God's dealing with Israel. That was on October 25th of last year, okay? And I did a lesson on that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if you can clarify the, the way that God presented himself among the sacrificed or the, the animals. Sure. Um, yeah, let me back up on that. So the question was uh, clarifying about God, how God presented himself. Uh, let's go back. Let's, let's jump back to it. Go with me back in Genesis, and let me find the spot. I think it was around 14, if I remember. Nope, it wasn't 14. Hang on, let's find it here. All right, channel, uh, chapter 12, God says, I'll make of thee a great nation. He said, I'll, uh, I will give the, uh, seed this land. He goes to Egypt. Chapter 13, he comes back. Lot chooses Sodom. Uh, okay, it's not chapter 14. Chapter, 15. there it is, chapter 15. Uh, look at chapter 15, verse number 7. God speaking and said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He said unto, them, unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Adam dro uh, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, God, said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, prophetically the Egyptian captivity. And also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. So God himself passed between the pieces. What would happen in the covenant is they would, they would cut an animal apart, they lay its carcass down, and two men who were making a covenant of maybe of uh, a fealty to each other in time of war. I will protect you, you protect me. I will come to your aid, you come to my aid. They would stand on either side and they would do like a figure eight between the carcass of the animal. The two men would walk in a figure eight and it was a blood oath saying, if I fail to uphold this blood covenant, my blood is upon my head. That's what they were doing. It was, in, you know, and in America, we had the um, kids still do this. It harkens back to the days of the Native Americans where they would, they would, you know, do a blood covenant by making a cut on their hand or their wrist and then they would grab hands, make a blood oath, right? Mm -hmm. That's what this was, a blood oath. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it wasn't Abram moving between the pieces. He was off to the side in a trance and God move between the pieces. He swear by himself. Hebrews, by the way, a little commercial for Sunday school. This Starting this Sunday, I'm going to begin teaching the Forever Young Sunday School class in this room. And we are going to begin with a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Hebrews. And Hebrews talks about 
that because God could swear by nobody greater, he swore by his own name. All right, so uh, we always swear by somebody greater. You know, I swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on my mother's grave. I swear on, you know, you hear those kind of statements. Who is God going to swear by? There is no one greater. So he just swore by his own name. He moved between the pieces himself. He made a blood oath with Abram by his own name. Yeah, that's what that's referring to. All right, great question. Okay, so um, so again, if you want to know more about that eternal covenant, uh, go to our YouTube channel and uh, just type in our YouTube channel, Plan of God Revealed, and look for Lesson 3 from October 25th of 2023. All right, so Israel, the first of the two nations that have a godly foundation. The second one is America. America's founders were motivated by their Christian faith. They're motivated by their Christian faith. Um, as we talk about this, uh, when we read about the pilgrims, the pilgrims firmly believed that the authority to govern comes from God. God is the one who set up government. So they were not rebels. These were not People were saying, you know, we, we are rebels and we don't want anybody to rule over us. No, they believed in the authority of government and that Christians ought to be in subjection to that authority unless that authority violated God's laws. By the way, that's a biblical position. Take your Bible, go with me. I forgot to write the reference in your notes, but it, go with me to the book of Acts. I believe we're in chapter number four, if I remember correctly. Let's go find that spot. Acts chapter, I believe it's in chapter number four. Yes, it is. So, uh, Peter and John are preaching in the temple in chapter four, verse 13. They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant. They marveled. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And when they saw the man which was healed, they couldn't say, they could say nothing against it. They couldn't argue that, that they had authority because the man was standing there healed. So they were trying to figure out what to do. <coughs> so they went into the council in verse 16. They said, what are we going to do with these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done. It's, by manifest, it's manifest to all of them that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But that has spread no further among the people. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Wow, a wonderful miracle has happened. Let, let's encourage them to do more. Let the power of God come on our nation. No, 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 no. We don't want this, this miracle stuff to spread because it threatens our authority. Isn't that crazy? That's, that's what their mindset was. That is spread no further. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Look what Peter said in verse 19. And Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, hearken, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. All right? So, yes, we are to obey authority over us. The Puritans believe that. But when they are given a choice to obey an ungodly law, or to stand for God, they're going to stand for God, right? So if there comes a day where it is illegal to go to church, you will have to make a choice. I received a letter this week in an email from a missionary, um, the same one that our daughter Trina worked with for two years in China, of a missionary who they have to meet in a different location every single week right now. <clears throat> the new laws are cracking down so hard they are not able to find a place to rent because now if someone rents to someone doing an illegal activity the person renting to them can go to jail so the property owners won't even rent to them it's getting worse and worse so what do you do do you quit having church no the church goes underground right so who are you going to obey? Are you going to obey God or are you going to obey man? And that's the choice that sometimes has to be made. And so the Puritans, when they came to America, they were not throwing off the shackles of government. 
They were coming seeking religious freedom. And this wide open land had no government over it. Uh, the king, king was a long ways off. You know, he was, he was a several weeks journey by boat, a perilous trip by boat, and it had no real influence over this wide open new land. And they said, we have an opportunity to go and still be loyal to the crown, but be able to worship according to the dictates of our own conscience. That's what they were seeking. They were, they were generally, the Puritans especially, were very loyal to the crown. They considered themselves to be subjects of the king, but they also believed they had a God-given right. They coined the term soul liberty, individual soul liberty, the God-given right to follow God after the dictates of their own conscience rather than it being dictated to them by government. Uh, the reason that was so important is the whims of government change. You notice in America, every four to eight years, our entire government outlook can flip-flop, right? You can go back and forth. Well, even in, in that day, though it often wasn't that close, it still happened, you'd have one king who said, I'm Church of England, and then, you have an, then you'd have another king or queen, I'm Catholic. And then another one, I'm Church of England, and another one, I'm Catholic. And, and whenever a new one came into power, the opposite side got persecuted. And then, but no matter which one was in power, the dissidents, the ones who refused to take the license from either Catholics or Church of England, they continued to be persecuted. All right, so that's what they came seeking that freedom. They had the mindset, they understood it's a biblical principle that authority is God given. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, I want you to realize when Paul wrote that in Romans 13 to the Roman church, they were living under one of the most godless, wicked, immoral uh, re uh, political systems in the face of the earth. And he still said, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. So whether it's a, in America, whether it's a Democrat in office or a Republican in office, it makes no difference to our responsibility. We are to be subject to the authorities over us. Okay? Exodus 18.21 Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of ten. God said, listen, you need to have righteous people in government. So yes, it is in, we're in a nation where we're able to select our own rulers. We need to vote our conscience. We need to. You don't always have a choice. Uh, when I look at our presidential elections right now, we have an extraordinarily flawed immoral, brash, arrogant, ungod, generally ungodly candidate on the one side. And on the other side, we have a puppet who will do whatever the puppet masters tells them to do, has no moral uh, foundation of their own at all. But I do believe there is a very clear difference in what their policy positions are. And by the way, we are not voting on the pastor of America. We're not. Right? We are voting for a politician. And yes, both of them, in my opinion, are extremely flawed. But there is a complete difference from a biblical morality uh, standpoint of what their stated policies are. And that's all we can go by. That's all we can go by. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, in Exodus 18, God told the children of Israel, when you set up a government... Set it up with righteous people. So as best as we're able, that's what we need to do. We need to do that. Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Yeah. So the pilgrims, and especially the Puritans, they were not coming because they wanted to rebel against authority. That's not why they came to America. Okay? Um, they, they came looking for religious freedom, but they still considered themselves subjects of the crown. Look at some of the early documents. We're actually going to do an entire lesson 
on this one. Uh, oh, I, I think I already mentioned this. Uh, the pilgrims firmly believe the authority to govern comes from God, and we ought to be in subject to that authority unless it violates God's law. Look at the Mayflower Compact. If you, if you, I mean, for some of us, this was a long time ago in school, right? <laughs> but have have you looked at that recently? Yeah. Let, let me give you just the opening part of the Mayflower Compact. Look what it says. This is before they ever got off the ship. They pulled into Plymouth Harbor, and before they ever got off the ship, they made a covenant between them. So this is what we are going to do before we get off the ship. Look how it's, what it reads. In the name of God, amen. <laughs> That's a great start, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. This is a political document, by the way, of men who were deep in their faith. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, look how they view themselves, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country. They, they put exploration for the wealth and glory of England third on their stated goal. Their number one stated goal was they were undertaking this voyage for the glory of God. <clears throat> their number two stated goal was for the advancement of the Christian faith. Wow. You know what, you know what they were talking about? Being missionaries. Yeah. That's what they were talking about. They wanted to evangelize the natives on American soil. That's what they wanted to do, evangelize. And then thirdly, for the uh, advancement of the honor of the king and country, said we are, we are then doing a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. We do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and the furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue of the hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. Signed at Plymouth Rock, November 11, 1620. Wow. That, that I mean, anyone who says that that America was not founded with people have with a heart for God needs to read our founding documents. This is the first one. The earliest document starts with saying we're here to advance the kingdom of God. We're here to promote the glory of God. That's why we're here. Some of the earliest pilgrims were those of Puritan background. They came to America specifically in search for religious freedom. We're going to talk about them in a future, in a future lesson. Um, one, one of those founders was John Winthrop. He was their, one of their pastors. And he wrote this. He said, we shall be, by the way, he was on the Mayflower. He was one of the signers of that compact. And he wrote this, we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Yeah, so we're, you know what he's referring to? He's referring back to what Jesus said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. He said, that's going to be us. <clears throat> we're going to be a city on the hill. The world is going to look at us because we are going to do things different. Uh, that quote, by the way, is in your end notes, uh, end note number two. Uh, here's a third one. The American Declaration of Independence includes language that evokes the founder's belief that theirs was a noble cause that stood in agreement with biblical principles. Okay, and So the Declaration of Independence says they call on God in this thing. Um, you remember, the, maybe from your school days, I included it in your end notes, but listen to what it says. It, it ends by saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator 
with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They were saying, we believe governments are valid. They derive their power from the consent of the governed, but they are only doing what is, what is a natural outgrowth of what God gave us. Our creator gave us these inalienable rights to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, That's, that was the way they started out. Okay? Uh, the American Declaration of Independence continues uh, with a, a commitment toward God in, in asking God to protect them in this great endeavor. Uh, he, the, it ends by saying, for the support of this declaration and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They were praying, and they put it in writing. We are depending upon God to help us. What a far cry from what we see and what we hear in American government today, right? But uh, that's our roots. That's where, that's where it is from, okay? So two nations on the face of the earth have had God at the founding of the nation. Israel spoken into existence by God, and America, where Christians said, we want a place to live and to be governed where we have the right to worship God freely. They didn't come to this land looking for technology. That's not why they came. They didn't come looking to get rich. They didn't come looking to have big houses and to have fast cars and to, you know, have all have iPhones and all that. No, they came, they came to start a new nation under God. Uh, how about our Pledge of Allegiance? I, I didn't include that in these documents, but how about our Pledge of Allegiance? All right? One nation under God, indivisible, with life and liberty to all who believe. Our national motto, in God we trust. Now, the reason I didn't include those is those are actually later in the study in part two. They aren't part of our founding documents, but they are still part of our history. Amen? All right, now, there are two competing philosophies of American history. Um, to go through these, let's, uh, uh, let's take this book out. Is it European expansionism or is it providential heritage? What that means is there are some who say, no, America is just European expansionalism. We were running out of space in Europe, so we sent everyone to a new place that was uh, rel relatively unoccupied, had them push the natives out so we could take over and rape the land of all of its uh, resources, right? Or was America founded as a part of providential heritage? Provident what's, what, how was it? Two competing philosophies. Uh, the, look, look in the book in the introduction on page number 10. And uh, we'll just uh, touch on these. These are the topics the book will cover, by the way, in the book of One Nation Under God. There are two competing philosophies or worldviews in modern America. On the one hand, America retains the rich godly heritage that originally made her great. On the other hand, secularists are increasingly jeopardizing both our heritage and the religious liberties of all Americans. Although traders, explorers, and businessmen also had a hand in the founding of America, historical revisionists cannot erase the fact that the first people who founded colonies in this land were primarily religious nonconformists. Okay? That's an important statement. They were the nonconformists. Um, this statement he made in here that uh, historical revisionists cannot erase this fact the danger is in public conscious, consciousness, it is being erased. Uh, did any of you in school read George Orwell's 1984? Any of you read it? All right. One of the, one of the things in Orwell's 1984 is uh, it was set 
uh, while they use variants on the names, essentially it was two great power superpowers, America and Russia, the Soviet Union. That was the, that was the basis of the book, but they, he used slightly different names. But he had the whole world divided under two world powers. And so what would happen, the uh, protagonist in the story, his job is he is a copywriter for the newspapers. And whenever the country would change who one of their enemies was, his job was to go back and change the old newspapers. Because the mother country was always at war with this country because we are always right. But then when they decide, oh no, but we need the natural resources, the oil from this country. So instead they decide to form an alliance with that one. Now this country's their enemy. So his job was to go back and find every reference in the historical article uh, archives where, where this second country was the enemy and change it where we've always been their ally and they've always been our enemy. So that, so that uh, the books were always being revised. The libraries always had a different revision of the book. The newspapers were always different. And it was illegal to keep old copies. The only ones who could have the old copies were the archivists. So they could change them. Wow. Guess where most people get their news today? They get it in a medium that they cannot retain. Electronically. So all it takes is for somebody in authority to say, you know what, that's not the way it was. This is the way it was. Write it this way. And the old way disappears. Never to be seen again. That's what revision historians do. Easier today than it's ever been because of iPhones, iPads, etc. I mean, how many of us even get the Oregonian anymore? I don't. You know, I, I read it online, but then I often wonder when I'm reading it online, I wonder if what I'm reading is different than the way it was when they first wrote it yesterday. Did they get feedback? Did they get, you know, because it always has an edited date. And, and though the article was first published yesterday, but I'm reading it today, hmm, I wonder what changed. I always question that. I wonder what changed. And I have no way of knowing because I don't have a hard copy of it. Right? Yeah, that's revisionist history. That's what's happening in our world today with that philosophy. So here are the, the, the 10 competing world, the, the worldview is how they compete in 10 areas. First one, Christopher Columbus opened the new world to the old. He was motivated by his Christian faith to make the voyage. In number two, in 1620, the pilgrims drafted our nation's first self-governing document, the Mayflower Compact. They clearly stated they come to the new world to glorify God, to advance the Christian faith. Number three, the Puritans who followed the pilgrims to New England created Bible-based commonwealths. Uh, number four, various settlements throughout the colonies provided refuge for religious dissidents. Number five, the education of America's settlers and founders was uniquely Christian and Bible-based. Number six, the Great Awakening was a key factor in uniting the pre-revolutionary the colonies. Number seven, the pulpits in the colonies played a pivotal role in encouraging American independence from Britain. Uh, Christianity, number eight, played an important role in bringing about American independence. <coughs> Excuse me. Number nine, the Declaration of Independence is based on Christian ideas and viewpoints. And number 10, the biblical understanding of the sinfulness of my, man was the guiding principle behind the United States Constitution. Those are all important statements. That's what this book deals with. That's why we're going to use it as one of our resources here. All right? Okay. Um, let, let me ask you this question. What does it mean to be an American? Your worldview does color your perception. What does it mean to you to be an American? What does it mean? So don't tell me. I have the unique ability to do what I want, say what I want, be where I want. Have the freedom of yeah. religion, speech. Yeah, self-government. Freedoms given to me. Freedoms, by God. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That that's unique. Um, that's unique. The uh, uh, we we can't be blind to the fact that America was founded by and continues to be led by deeply flawed people who are sinners. But being an American 
mostly for most of us has to do with freedoms, right? That's the way most of us are. And I mean, but but let's not neglect to acknowledge that there have been some huge missteps in our history. You only need to read uh, just some some of the the, the how about the, reading the book Roots by Alex Haley. Um, although it's a fictional rendering, it accurately de- uh, portrays the horrific and wicked treatment of the African at the hands of slavery in America. It's, 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 uh, uh, or The Trail of Tears by John L. It's a look at the, at the horrific treatment of the Cherokee Indians. Um, you know, we, we've, uh, we've not always lived by our stated pledge of life and liberty and justice for all. We haven't. All right. But while we are flawed, there's a lot about America that I love. There's a lot. There's no other nation that I'd rather be in. Amen. Uh, I've listed here for you from a Student's Guide to U.S. History by Wilfred McClay. Um, the common perceptions that... Uh, Americans hold about the nation. Uh, here's some, a city on a hill. We are a moral exemplar. That was what Winthrop said. We're going to be a city on a hill, right? That's what we're going to be. Uh, the empire of reason as a land of enlightenment. Na- nature's nation, uh, nation uniquely in harmony with nature. America is the new order of the ages, uh, the redeemer nation, a redeemer of the corrupted world, the new Eden a nation dedicated to the proposition that America is a land of equality. The melting pot. Have you ever heard that one? America's the melting pot. Um, a land of opportunity. A land of immigrants. Some call it the new Israel. America is God's chosen nation. I've already explained to you why I don't hold to that one. But that is what some people think of when they think of America. A nation of nations as a transnational container for diverse national identities. The first new nation and the indispensable, the indispensable nation. Boy, that's an arrogant term. Indispensable. Yeah. But that, that's what some people think of. That's their perceptions when they think of America. What does it mean to you to be an American? We already asked uh, that. Um, you know, how, how does this list of uh, common perceptions uh, resonate with you? Some of them to me make me sort of cringe, right? But there's some of them I look at and say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's something missing from the list? Place of God. Yeah. Place of worship, God. Place where God is easily found. Yeah, I like that. Um, and shared. <laughs> and can be shared, exactly. What bothers you about this list? Uh, some of the ones I already touched on. The indispensable nation. Boy, there's no... What's the Bible say? Uh, take heed... Ye that think ye stand, yeah. lest you fall, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, we're not indispensable. Uh, God could, just like uh, um, uh, Mordecai told Esther, she, he said to Esther, if you do not go in to the king, then you, you and your family will be lost and God will raise up a deliverer from someone else, right? Yeah, we're not indispensable, we're not. Okay. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 about the principles of obedience to God and mm-hmm. were blessed and disobedience right. were cursed. Yeah, Leviticus and Deuteronomy mm-hmm. talk about uh, when when those that those those, those less the curses and the blessings. Yes. If you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you if you uh, disobey, you'll be cursed. Yeah. Um, in uh, that student's guide to U.S. history, McClay wrote this. One of the most pervasive ideas of America is that it is an experiment. And th- th- that's, yeah. that's a great thought. Several of the early founders talked about that. Benjamin Franklin is reported, it's anecdotal, it's not in any of his biographies, it's anecdotal that it was reported that when he came out of uh, Constitution Hall, he said, well, I think we have a nation if we can hold on to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's that's it. So uh, as we, as we wrap it up tonight, with uh, just some final thoughts, every one of us have preconceptions and biases in how we think in relation to our country. We're influenced by what we hear in the media, by the books we read, by the movies we see, by the influencers who we allow to enter into our mind. 
Now, the purpose of this study is not to um, uh, pump up feelings of Christian nationalism. That's not what we're about. Uh, we're, we're not creating a rallying uh, cry for uh, rednecks to shout, Cuz America! It's not what we're doing. Okay? Uh, but we want, through these lessons, to take a journey through the historical record of some of the people and philosophies that were at the heart of America's founding and show how they founded the foundational principles of American Christian history. It's needed. Let me, let me read you this quote from 1965. All right, so we're talking 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago, and how much has changed since then. Listen to this quote, 1965, the foundation for American Christian education, Rosalie Slater. For over 100 years, Americans have not known or learned of America's Christian history. Five generations of Americans have produced a national ignorance concerning the providential founding of this nation and of God's hand in preserving, defending, and leading the colonists to victory in 1775 to 1781. Today, we have no proud hero, heroes, mm -hmm. no models of character or leadership to inspire our youth. This was 60 years ago. We have no identity for courage, conscience, or compassion to cherish as a part of the proud fabric which a people weaves into its character and tradition. The reason is we have allowed our treasury to be robbed and pillaged of its gold, the gold of Christian character. That's why we need the study. That's why we need it. The pilgrims and the founding fathers of America sought to live by a biblical ethic that integrated justice, mercy, and humility before God in the governance of their new society. Right as what Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what America's founders desired to do. All right? So, <clears throat> next week, we're going to jump in a little bit in, in the missionary endeavor, the heart of Western discovery, and go a little bit deeper into Christopher Columbus, all right? So what I'd like for you to do next week is to read chapter one of Christopher the Christ Bearer, um, Christopher the Christ Bearer Columbus, all right? And read that chapter, and read chapter two on the Mayflower Compact. So read those. And uh, so, that you're, so that you're on the same page with me as we jump into the lesson next week. All right, so work on, read those two chapters. And uh, if you want to take care of the book, you can do that with me. You can do that online. Or if you need to do it later, you can do that as well. All right, thank you for being here tonight. I hope this will be an encouraging study for you. I sure am enjoying already getting into the study myself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for America. Thank you for giving us the privilege to be here. Help us, Lord, to learn the why of what has made America great in the past. And Lord, help us to seek your face individually and as a nation once again, that you may bless America. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We're dismissed. Thank you.